Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 19. Let me encourage you about the uh, Easter pageant. Keep that in your prayers, and I encourage you to plan to be here. I think it'll be a time of blessing and, and a challenge to our heart as well. And uh, Isaac mentioned when he, uh, I'm, I'm glad he mentioned what he mentioned about music. I appreciate that. But I need to repent because when he was playing the offertory, I leaned over to Jerry and said, that's got to be the worst offertory I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> so uh, I fall in that category. So I just want to know that, uh, that I repent. Exodus chapter 19, this morning we'll read there for in a few moments. Now let me give you a little background just so you get caught up to where we are uh, in, our, in our study, in our series on uh, transition, transitioning from the children of Israel going from the land of Egypt to the promised land. This is, we'll see as we get into this first verse of the 19th chapter, this is the third month. So they're just uh, between two and three months out of the land. It's like the time that uh, from January 1st to where we are today, the, what happened to the children of Israel? God led them out of Egypt. They saw the pillar of fire by, by uh, uh, night and the pillar of cloud that led them by day. They came to the, uh, just a day out and they come to the Red Sea and here is this insurmountable uh, path that they have to cross. How are they gonna get there? Look behind and there's the Egyptian army. So they complain to Moses. Moses goes to the Lord. Moses comes back and says, stand still and see the salvation of God. The sea parts and they walk across on dry ground where the last Israelite gets across. The sea collapses on the Egyptian army and they drowned in the sea. Thereafter, they, they thought they were going for like a two-week journey from the, from, the prom, from the land of Egypt to the promised land. A shortcut would have been that way. But God said to Moses, he said, the people aren't ready. They'll go, there'll be battles there, and they're not going to be ready uh, to, uh, to fight, and they'll go back to Egypt. So I'm going to take you another way. Little did they realize how much longer the other way would be. So they had prepared for just a couple of weeks. They didn't have a whole lot to, pre uh, to prepare with because they were in, in servitude. But they leave, and then they come to the place on the other side of the, of the Red Sea, and they are running out of food. And they complain to Moses again. And they, Moses goes to the Lord and said, Lord said, I'm going to give you something that beyond their imagination, something they've never tasted before. And it was the manna. We call it the manna because they didn't know what it was. And that's what the word manna means. And so the children of Israel had this, this delightful food that God gave them for 40 years. They ran out of water. They, they were so angry at Moses at this time. Now, this is just in the second month. They ran out of water, and they took stones ready to stone Moses. And God says, take some of the elders, go up to the mountain, and go to, the, uh, to where I tell you to go, and, and I want them to witness the miracle that's going to take place. And they did, and they come back and tell the people there's water God had provided, and the children of Israel had finished their complaining. Jethro comes, brings support of Moses' wife. Jethro is the father-in-law of Moses. He brings his daughter and, and Moses and Sipporah's two sons come to join Moses. And now we come into the 19th chapter of the book of Genesis, uh, book of Exodus. As we get into this 19th chapter, there is a break in how God was dealing with the people. I don't want to get too technical with this, but I just want to give you a little groundwork as we, as we go in to understand this. I don't like labels. I don't like what people, how people label things. I just like to uh, study and look at the Word of God and, and uh, come up with what God lays upon my heart. Augustine said, and I quote, distinguish in the ages, and the, distinguish the ages and the scriptures harmonize. God has divided human history into ages. And then he said, God in these last days, as an illustration, has spoken unto us by his Son. The ages, are, it, they may be long, they may be short, but distinguish them is not the length of time but the way in which God deals in particular times and so there are a lot of ideas of how God does that and a lot of different uh, schools of thought and what he did but all of us would agree there's a difference between what God did under the law and what God did under grace and what God continues to do under grace God dealt differently well if we accept that we're almost forced to uh, to accept the idea that there was the period of time 2,000 years from the creation of man until the law was given, God dealing with people and God dealt differently with people. Give you a couple examples. When Cain killed his brother Abel, God put a mark upon Cain 
and said that from this day forward, as he goes out, this mark is that, to show who Cain is, and nobody is to take his life. He is protected by my hand in, in Genesis chapter 4 and in verse 15. After the flood, in Genesis chapter 9, it says, God says, whosoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. So there was an instance when God said, nobody, here's a murderer by the name of Cain. Nobody is to touch him. After the flood, God said, if there's a murderer, he must die, and uh, that is the judgment of God. Leviticus chapter 11, certain foods were designated as unclean. Jesus talked about all foods being clean. In Ezra chapter 10, we talk about the Jews who were told to put away the strange wives and their children. They were to take them and put them aside because they married the foreigners. They married those that were not Jewish. In, in the book of 2 Corinthians and the seventh chapter, it was that, that, God, that uh, Paul wrote the church and said, even if you ha you're married to an unbeliever, if the unbeliever wants to stay, let him stay. You're not to put him away. So just the opposite uh, was true. So we understand that there are way, different ways that God has dealt with people. And then in, uh, it tells us also, it refers, Paul refers to the age to come. So whether you think there are two or there are four or there are six or seven, some eight different ways that God has worked in the, in the different ages. It's really not something to, to break fellowship over, but it's important for us to understand that as we come into this 19th chapter. Because as we see, there is a distinction. There's the, God is dealing differently with people than he had before. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 19 of Exodus. The third month, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. And they had departed from Rephidim, remember that means resting place, and had come into the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, so Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And these are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and laid before them all these words which the Lord commanded him. Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. So Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud. The people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forevermore or forever. And so Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. There are three times that Moses makes this journey back back and forth in conversation with the Lord in this, in, this passage, in this chapter. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and, and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. You shall set bounds for all the people all around and take heed to yourself that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whosoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. And when the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near to the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people, sanctified the people, washed their clothes, and said to the people, Be ready for the third day. Do not come near your wives. Then it shall come to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And uh, the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai and the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, this is a repeated warning, he's repeating what he had said, go down, warn the people, lest they break through to gaze at the Lord 
and many of them perish. Don't touch it, don't even gaze. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves, lest the Lord break out against them. But Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you've warned us, saying, set bounds around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, away, go down, and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priest and the people break through to come up to the Lord, lest he break out against them. So God was establishing the principle of of how they should approach because he's ready to give them the commandments. Let's look at them in chapter uh, 20. And this this is interesting. As we look, as we, first of all, understand that the commandments were not given in order that we would be able to obtain a righteousness with God. In, in the book of, uh, of Romans, in chapter 3 and verse 20, he says, Therefore, he said, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For in the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law was given. These Ten Commandments were given not so we can all right, I've tamed number one, I've got number two, I've got number three, and therefore I'm going to be right in the sight of God. Uh-uh. He said the law was given to show you just how weak you are and how sinful you are. Galatians 3.11 says, But no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. So the law was given to show them their sinfulness. Now as we look at the law, we'll see the first four commandments that are given deal with the relationship of man to God. The next six give relationship of man to man, or man within his community. The community was the nation of Israel. Our community is different. Now we have a problem sometimes when we look at the Ten Commandments, and I want to spend a little time here this morning, because sometimes we look at that, well that's Old Testament, that's under the law, I live under grace. Yeah, we, we have, they, they, you've heard people say, these are not the ten, uh, ten guidelines, these are the Ten Commandments that God has given. So these are, these are for us. These are ways to live. We heard of Judeo-Christian society in which we live. Well, this is the Judeo part that we're going to be looking at. But how is it relevant? What does it mean to us today to look at these, these commandments? It's interesting in the commentaries. They'll have all different ideas from it. I think William MacDonald, the best, he calls it the ten divine rules of human conduct. And I think that's true. I think we come to the point of seeing how we ought to live. And these commandments make up and teach us how to live. What I've done in in my Bible is in the margin, I've taken next to a commandment and I put a word. And the word kind of summarizes the commandment and helps us to understand today how we live, how it affects us today as, as Christians. So the commandments of God are given We're given to the nation of Israel, but they will apply to us in our lives, and we forget that sometimes. So let's look at these these, uh, commandments that deal with our divine rules of conduct in our Christian life. Verse 1, the Lord spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now understand what Moses is saying here, what God is doing. God is saying, reminding them who he was and what he did. He said, I'm the Lord God. I'm the one that brought you out of the land of bondage. This is who I am. This is what I've done. Look in your life. Understand who God is. Understand what he's done, how he works in you, how he continues to work. And that causes us to understand exactly what what, uh, Moses is writing, what God said. Verse 3 is the first commandment. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. Next to that, I wrote the word religion. You could put faith but religion. I did so for the reason because he said, you shall have no other gods before me. This deals with the uniqueness of who God is, how unique our God is. Do you realize today that the majority of the world does not follow verse 3? The majority of the world does not believe that God is one God. The majority of the world follows uh, Islam, Muhammad, uh, they, uh, they follow uh, what he has to say, Allah. They, they're, they're a Buddhist. There are the Shintus. There are uh, the Hinduist. Uh, a, million plus, a billion plus people in India. And Shintus have all kinds of gods. And so what it is is an attack against religion. You see, what you believe about God determines everything about you. 
And what you believe about who he is and what he accomplishes determines everything and how you think, what you do, how you respond in your life. So it's important for us to understand that our God is unique and what we believe about him, the basis of it all, is found in that third verse. Look with me in verse four through six. We find the second commandment. You shall not make unto yourself any carved images. Some of the translations, graven images. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to keep those who love me and uh, uh, keep my commandments. He's dealing with no graven images. I have the word worship written next to, to, to that commandment in, my mar- in the margin of my Bible. Our worship must be spiritual and not material. He says you're not to have any graven images at all. He said, I'm talking about worshiping. It was conflicting with the people of the day and the land and the Canaan they were going to go to, the promised land. There were, there were all these uh, people that had all kinds of false gods. And they would have graven images. They would take images out of wood. They would take images out of stone. And they would carve in the, uh, and hew out the stone for, for their gods. You read later on in this, in this chapter and the, the next chapter, and you see where God said to the people of, of Israel, he said, I don't want any, stone, any image hewed out of stone. If you take stone, he said, take it and put it upon each other, and you can sacrifice upon that. But there are no graven images that are be taken from that stone. He said, I want you to understand our worship is spiritual. Thirdly, in verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And I've got next to that the word reverence. God is to be honored. God is to be protected by his followers. I, I cannot emphasize, I say this quite often, I cannot emphasize the importance of Christians respecting and reverence the name of God. How often I hear Christians, and I, I even cringe when I use this illustration, but I need to do that so you understand. Christians say, oh, boy, God, it's sure a hot day today, isn't it? Uh, or, uh, God, I, 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 don't, I just don't know, talking to somebody else. Uh, God, I sure hope I feel better. You know, that's blasphemous. That's taking the name of the Lord in vain. That's not speaking to God. That's not protecting the name of Jehovah God. You, you realize in, in Bible times, in Old Testament, when the scribe would, would copy the, the word of God, that they would take a pen when they'd come to the name of God, Yahweh. They didn't have the letters to do it, and so we have four letters in the English language, but they would take, come to the name of Yahweh. They would, they would take a brand new ink, uh, a brand new pen, and a quill, and they would write the name, and then they would take it and put it away, not throw it away, but put it away never to be used again because of the holiness of God. And Christians walk around, oh God, it's a hot day today. You know, uh, we need to wake up. And that's what he's talking about when he deals with reverence. Let's look in, in verse uh, eight for number four. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, nor uh, your son, nor your daughter, nor your uh, male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. In the six days uh, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rest of the seventh day. Therefore the Lord God blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. When God created everything. He did so in six days, rest of the seventh day. Never commanded us to do that. We never hear of a restriction until the manna that we talked about uh, in a chapter or two ago. When the manna came, God told them how to collect it in the seventh day. There was not to be a collection. Now he comes along and gives the commandment to the children of Israel. And he's telling them, this is what you do. You're to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The name, the word I have next to that is time. He said, what, what God's purpose is, and, and the Jews had, had taken it and so abused it, 
that they, when we were in Israel, we were using a, a projector. Somebody came and spoke to us on Saturday, the Sabbath, Shabbat, and they came in and we had a projector and the pre and the rabbi of the hotel uh, uh, objected to that and came to the hotel manager and wanted us to turn it off because we were abusing the Sabbath. And we can take, we can go to school on, and take it so far that we miss what he's talking about. But he says, I'm, it, the idea of time, you break the routine of everyday life and you take time, you take a day and you remember me and you worship me and you, we do it all the time. We worship God every day. But he says, I want you to remember me and take that time. You know, the problem that I had when public schools 40 years ago took prayer out and people were saying, well, you know, it's okay because most of people's prayers aren't heard anyway and they don't know the Lord. The problem is, we, on that day we, we decided to take it out is the day we've, we ceased to recognize God for who he was. And we said, no more God. We don't need him. It's a recognition. I think he's talking about our time. Verse 12, he says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the, upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. I have next to that the word authority. He's talking about the authority in the home. The duration of time dealt with the nation under the covenant promise of God when God said, will you get into the land that I've given you? He was not dealing with individuals with uh, longevity of life because they were keeping certain things and they were being obedient. He's dealing with the nation as they were going into the land. Verse 13, you shall not kill, you shall not murder. Life is the word that I have. We are made in the image of God. Every one of us, every saved person, every lost person is made in the image of God. We need to respect that, and that's where life comes in. Don't take life. It was to preserve society. Come along, and your neighbor's dog comes in your yard, and you don't like it. If there wasn't the law, you'd take a gun and go over and kill your neighbor so the dog wouldn't be in your yard anymore. You'd kill the dog afterward. If there was no law, why not do it? There's a law that God said, I'm going to preserve society. So therefore, you're not going to kill. Verse 14, he said, you shall not commit adultery. Purity. He's dealing with the sanctity of the home. Why is adultery wrong? Some people in our society come along and say, well, as long as you have two consenting adults, it doesn't really matter. Particularly if, if, uh, the, if they're married and their partner doesn't find out, it's okay. That's our society. Or they talk about open marriages or whatever. Why is it wrong? Because it's an attack against the sanctity of the home, the trust factor in the home. And so that's why it's wrong. Jesus, uh, God said to, to Moses, don't let it be done. It's purity. Verse 15, he says, you shall not steal. I have the word property. This is talking about community stability. You have what is yours. I have what is mine. That's our property. And it is, it is distinguished. That was what was so earth-shaking in Acts chapter 4. When the church decided because of, of some of the persecution that was coming against the believers, the church decided this wasn't good. So they, some of those that had the wherewithal sold their property, sold some of their property, and gave the money to the church, to the disciples then. The apostles could then distribute it to those that had need. That's why it was so earth-shaking. But it was, it was a, a command of property. Then in verse, uh, verse 16, he says that uh, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Tongue is the word I have next to that. That's protecting individual reputations. I think that this is probably the most abused of all of the commandments done by Bible-believing Christians. The tongue. He says, I want to protect reputation. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. If you go by two, two or three people are sitting around talking quietly and you walk by and there's dead silence and they, hey, how are you and so forth and they don't carry in their conversation most of the time, not always because sometimes it can be very personal, but most of the time it's because they're violating this commandment. We talk. The Bible tells us how to handle if we have an issue like that. It tells us in Matthew 18, you got a problem with a brother. You go to the brother. Don't go to your brother's friend or your brother's non-friend. But you go to your brother, and here's, here's what, what, one of the commandments. Isn't it interesting? In the same law that God established, don't kill, he says, don't bear false witness. And sometimes, bearing false witness, you are interpreting a situation just exactly how you see it, 
And you may be wrong, though you may not know it. That's why you do what Matthew 18 says to do in the first place. Just think if every Christian would follow the Ten Commandments. Then he goes on and tells us in verse 17, he said, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you should not covet your neighbor's wife, your male servant, your female servant, or his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. I have the word contentment. And if, if the previous one, not bearing false witness, is the most abused, and that's just my opinion, this is holding a close second if it doesn't overpower number nine, contentment. Contentment with what you have. Contentment with what God has given. So what happens when we're not content is we go ahead and we have all kinds of problems. We have all kinds of, of, uh, of jealousy that takes place because of what somebody else has and we think we're better than them or we ought to have that or we're trying to keep up with the next door neighbor and we're not content. That means that we don't long for, that we don't desire, that we don't lust after something that is rightfully not ours. These are rules of, of human conduct. And if the entire world would follow the Ten Commandments, what kind of place would this be? What kind of place would our country be? What kind of place would our church be if everybody would follow the Ten Commandments? Now notice how the people respond in verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thundering and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking and when the people saw it they trembled and stood afar off. Fear and awe captivated them. Moses went back up to the mountain after the Ten Commandments and when he was there you read in the next several chapters we'll not do so and we'll just uh, uh, summarize as he went up to the mountain God then established the priesthood God established how they were the, what the tabernacle was to look like how they they to raise the, the means of, of building the tabernacle the funds and all that was involved and we go through to the uh, almost to the, to the end of the book of Exodus of, of what was taking place and how they responded that's as far as I want to go with that thought this morning. But I want us to take just in the few moments we have to look at what it really means to us. How do we take this and apply this further to our lives? Now Israel was in the transition period and God was preparing them. Something Israel did not expect, two weeks turned into 40 years. There was still a problem. What do we learn from that? First of all, I want you to understand, God extends grace. It's interesting to me that it was the Lord that called Moses to the mountain. It's not so much of our knowing God, and that's important, but it's God knowing us. I think of uh, Galatians 4, 9. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God. So the question is, does God know you? Have you put your faith and trust in him? God knows you. Then verse 4 you, of the 19th chapter, you talk about grace. You've seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. I mean, what did Israel do to come into the position of God saying what he did and protecting them like he did and like he has all through these years? He reminded them of what happened in Egypt. When it was fresh in their mind, uh, to, and he said, look what I did. To disbelieve God was to disbelieve your own eyes. Because they've seen what, what, what God had done, they understood the testimony of God, and they were excited about it. And I trust your relationship is with the Lord so that you've seen God work, and you can testify this is what God has done. But it says he bore them on eagle's wings. Years ago, I got interested in eagle's and I had pictures in my office, and I still have some that are round with eagles. And, and uh, an, an eagle would take its, uh, her eaglets and put them on her wingspan, which would be five, five and a half feet long. And she's teaching them how to fly. And she'll soar in the air, and then she'll flap her wings, and the eaglets will fall off the wings, and they will soar and try to flap their wings to learn to fly. And the mother eagle then will swoop under and catch them on her wings. And she'd soar in the air again. And then she'd come and flap her wings and the eagles would start to fall. And that's how she taught them to fly. And that's exactly what God was doing with the nation of Israel. He said, I'm not going to take you this way. I'm going to take you this way because I need to teach you. And he flapped the wings and, and Israel would, would flounder. And, and just before they were destroyed, God would swoop under 
and God would capture them. And he said, I've lifted up on eagle's wings. I'm reminded of uh, toward the end of the, uh, of the ministry of Moses as he's ready to leave this earth. He says in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy and uh, verse 11, he says, as eagles stir up the nest and hover over its young, spreading out its wings and taking them, ca- taking them up and carrying them on its wings, so the Lord alone led him, and they were, there was no foreign God with them. He's talking about the nation of Israel, how God carried them along. Imagine the speed of the eagle as it swoops to catch up the young as they were falling. Imagine the care of the Lord. Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. And then God says, I brought you to myself. Not only the life and the honor that we have of being with God, but it was a covenant relationship that Israel had. It was a communion with the Lord. Verse 5 of chapter 19, he talks about a a special treasure. God valued Israel above all. Titus 2.14 says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from, from all iniquity, all our lawless deeds, and purify unto himself his own special people, zealous for good works. In verse 6, we're called the king kingdom of priests and a holy nation, the nation of Israel. But I think in 1 Peter chapter 2, he talks about the righteousness that we have in him, that we are a holy nation, that we are peculiar people to those that put their faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. All of grace, what does Israel do to deserve it? All of grace, what do we do to deserve it? The grace of God. Number two, it's important, understanding the importance of being ready to meet God how casual we are on our approach to him. But notice the children of Israel, 19th chapter, 10th verse, God said, consecrate yourself. They all need to be consecrated. Make them holy, set apart, declare them to be distinct. They were to wash their clothes. They were to wash their mind. They were to wash their heart. There was a continual cleansing that was to take place. Isaiah 1 talks about the cleansing before we come and meet before the Lord. Moses told them to set boundaries around the mountain in chapter 19, verse 12 and 13. He said, I want you to send boundaries that you have a godly fear. In Hebrews, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. But here there was a boundary. And when they were sanctified and they washed their clothes and the trumpet sounded, God told Moses, make sure it's a long trumpet. Can you imagine hearing the trumpet sound and your friend saying, well, it's time to go up to the mountain. Uh, Maybe we ought to wait just to make sure it's a little longer blow before we go. And uh, when it was a long sound, God said, then I want you to come to the mountain. And they went to the mountain. And then in Deuteronomy, he deals with it again in the 33rd chapter and the third verse where he just simply says, yes, he loves the people. All the saints are at your hands. They sit down at your feet. Everyone receives your words. Can you imagine sitting at the feet of God and having God teach you? We'll see that happen in eternity. But here, Israel had the hand of God. Third thing, neglected responsibility is still responsibility. Children of Israel neglected all 10 commandments. God had to deal with them. But even if they're neglected, we still have a responsibility because if we don't do something about it, that will come back to haunt us. And I'll not take the time to read, time's gone, but when Saul was king, first king of Israel, first Samuel chapter 15, Samuel the prophet said, I want you to destroy Agag, I want you to destroy the Amalekites because of what we talked about last week when the Amalekites attacked, attacked Israel from the rear. He said, there gonna come a time of judgment and Saul was to pronounce the judgment and to destroy them all. Agag was the king. Saul didn't destroy him. So Agag lives until Samuel comes and Samuel kills him. But he still kept some of the best people alive. Five centuries later, there was an Agite by the name of Haman who tried to annihilate the nation of Israel, all Jews from Persia, because it was an attack to his power base. God intervened. But the result of that sin kept going for 500 years. You never know the consequences of your sin. And then number four, I want you to see the holiness of God. That's a truth that breaks out as I read that passage, that God is holy. What's interesting is that before God spoke to Moses, God told him, before he spoke to him to give the commandments, he told him to keep the people away and have them 
meet the cleansing rite in chapter 19 and verse 21. They were cleansed, they saw God work, and then in chapter 20 and 21, the Bible says they stood afar off. God says, don't let them come, they might gaze, but when they had cleansed, and then they saw what God was doing, they stood afar off. Psalm 4.4 simply says, stand in awe and sin not. Think about who he is. If there's anything that we need to see during our transitional period at Calvary, it's the fact that we need to see the holiness of God. If we're gonna be on the same page and accomplish exactly what God wants to accomplish, then we must walk in and conscious of the work of God and the power of God and the presence of God in our life and in our church. And that's my prayer. And I trust we learn from the Israelites' experience.